Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Always glad to have you with us today. We're going to take a look at a, a, a little financial institution you might have heard of. It's called Citizens Bank, Citizens Financial Group, technically. And we have joining us once again, returning to the show, Bruce Van Son. Bruce is the chairman and CEO of Citizens, and he joins us today to give us an update on the bank. Bruce, thanks for coming back. My pleasure, Tom. Always good to have you with us. So um, I was thinking about as we started, I actually looked back on the previous times we talked, and we focused a lot on the transition, because people might remember Citizens was owned, was, by Royal Bank of Scotland, right. and you sort of consciously decoupled, as the celebrities say, <laughs> about five, four years ago, right around when you came in as, as CEO. So I followed it closely. People at home might not have. Give us sort of a 30,000-foot view on the bank's transformation as it became independent and where it's today. Sure. So I think one of the keys that we had to do was really get the bank growing again because under RBS they were playing defense and we had to shrink the bank and weren't keeping up with the investments necessary in technology and capabilities and people. Uh, so that's really what we've done. Uh, the, the footings of the bank had shrunk to 120 billion. Today we're back up to 160 billion. I think we've grown smartly and uh, bringing new customers into the bank, making loans. Uh, and we also had to invest in capabilities. So we've hired a lot of commercial bankers, we've hired mortgage loan officers, wealth advisors. Um, and so uh, all those businesses, we have much broader capabilities now that we can uh, build deeper relationships with our customers and do more cross-sell and be more impactful with our customers. So ultimately we're trying to be a trusted advisor for our customers and if they're an individual, help them on life's journey and if they're a company, help them through the ups and downs of the business cycle. And I think that's all going very, very well. In a way, you, you for a bank that's, what were you found, 1820 something or way back 1829, when? 1829. 1829, okay, I've written that a few times. Uh, you were almost though like a startup when you came out of RBS, the way you talked about the bank, almost, you know, building, you had a foundation to build off of, yeah. but you had a lot of, some basic work to do, you felt, right. I remember when you came in. That's right. And, you know, it's, it's uh, to make all those investments, we had to figure out where were we over-indexed in areas where we could find efficiency. So we actually uh, did a bunch of streamlining of the organization, and then in turn, uh, were able to fund those reinvestments. So we've improved our profitability very dramatically, and the key to that has been we're growing our top line, our revenues faster than our expenses. And we've been able, I'd say, on average, we've done that about four or five percent per year. And probably the India industry average over that time has been zero to two percent. So that's really uh, helped propel us from when I came on board, our, our return on equity, which is a key profitability measure, was down around four or five percent. The last quarter, we just printed 14 percent. So we're up about 10 percent over the five-year period. So d just knowing the demographics, most people watching are more likely than not know you as retail depositors or maybe they have a mortgage with uh, citizens. So on the retail side, I'm, I'm curious uh, how you're viewing more competition potentially here in your home market in Rhode Island as well as the Boston area. Uh, at the big bank end of the spectrum, Chase is making a lot of noise that they're going to start opening retail branches around here where they haven't had a present. And then at the smaller end, you see a, a little bank like Bank Newport trying to encroach into Providence a bit like that. Citizens generally seen as the big dog around here uh, among the banks you know do you not really worry about that you just focus on your bank do you have a plan for how you're gonna you know fight back and keep your people uh, you know doing their retail deposits well, and that kind of work uh, with you again it's uh, if we're the trusted advisor and uh, people are really comfortable with us uh, as their banker, it's really hard for anybody to disrupt us whether it's big tech uh, big banks or smaller community banks uh, so what we have to do is keep investing so that uh, we, we do allow our frontline people to have all those capabilities and to have the latest technology. The whole world is moving digital very quickly. Everybody wants to you know, transact over their phone, pay bills online. So we're making huge investments there. So we have the latest and greatest. We have uh, new tools through FinTech partnerships. We have a, a ro robo-advisory service where you can get wealth allocation advice on your portfolios just with a point and click on your computer. There are a lot of things that we're investing in to just make us even better and more formidable, and uh, we'll keep doing that. Has it required you as a CEO and your senior leadership team to, you have to become kind of tech executives to some extent you because it's you have a, a lot of tech it's products. It's a huge uh, technology investment, and the other thing 
thing is that uh, the customer really doesn't want to pay extra for all that stuff. They just expect it because when they look we never at their, do. <laughs> their relationships with uh, Amazon and all the other big players out there that they're interacting with, uh, they're just getting more and more value and they're not actually, the prices are coming down. So a hard part for us is to figure out how do we, how do we self-fund that? Uh, and you're seeing in the branch configuration, we're trying to make the branches smaller, a little more fit for purpose, a little more like advice centers. And so we can reduce the numbers maybe by 10% over, over the five years. Uh, we've got this branch transformation program where we're uh, taking a 4,000 foot branch and making a 2,000 foot. It's nicer, it's got private offices where you can have meetings. Uh, and we're taking cost out as a, as a result. But we're still meeting that need because people still like to go into the branches. They still like to have conversations. You were telling me that you are interested in a mortgage. You want to talk to somebody and sit across the table for, uh, for something that's that important of a transaction. So we have to be able to offer that. But at the same time, if you get a check and you open your mail and you don't want to go to the bank, you want to be able to take a picture and boom, it's already in your account. So, so we're trying to do all of that, which makes Consumer banking, retail banking, really exciting, really interesting, probably more interesting than I can remember in a 30-year career. Now, the, one of the most interesting initiatives you have, I was just reading up on it again today, is it's called Citizens Access. Yes. Um, explain uh, the thumbnail sketch of what that is and what's different about it from what you've done historically. So what we noticed is that there's uh, many uh, competitors coming into our footprint offering the more rate sensitive in, uh, depositor uh, good deals on, uh, you know, you could have a CD, you could have a money market account, you could, we'll pay you more than what your current bank is paying. So we figured we need to do that um, and have that capability and be able to access deposits around the country uh, by going after that segment of the market. It's not everybody, it's generally the more affluent people who have bigger balances. Uh, so we uh, had a very uh, tough, uh, uh, quick initiative to get this thing off the ground. Uh, probably nine months start to finish, we launched a whole new platform. Which is like uh, lightning fast in lightning banking. Lightning fast in banking, <laughs> very, very fast. Um, but it's really well designed and the functionality is great. So Ted, if you uh, wanted to open a Citizens Access account in uh, you know less than five minutes, you could research, open, and fund the account. It's very easy to use. And we have now uh, opened over 50,000 new accounts. We have three billion in balances. Most of those are out of our footprint. Only 3% is coming from existing citizens customers. So, you know, what people were doing to us and coming into our market, we're doing back. And so we're going into Atlanta and California and Texas uh, and targeting households that we think will be uh, interested in these types of products. So what's good about it is, you know, everybody needs deposits to fund your loan growth. So we have another source to get deposits, but we're also getting good at digital. We're getting good at how to use data, how to target households, how to anticipate their needs and make them offers so they want to become customers of Citizens Bank. And that's where the playing field is moving. When you think five years, 10 years from now, more and more digital, more and more use of data. So this gives us an ability to test and learn. That's fascinating. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk much more with Bruce Van Zon, CEO of Citizens, including the economic outlook and whether he's got some of those recession jitters we're hearing about from people. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we are getting updated on the business of banking with Bruce Van Zon, Chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group, parent of Citizens Bank, and uh, one of the biggest financial institutions in the region, and actually in the country. I think you are you in the top twenty. Yeah, think. we're we're number twelve of the traditional retail and commercial yeah, banks of the classic banks, yes, as we think of the banks. Right. So you were talking about Citizens Access before, uh, which is the new online, very fast setup. A, a, a strong rate is offered there. That fits into you've been. Talking talking more and more about the need to sort of reshape how banking works to fit what millennials are expecting. You sure. know, what is, you know, what's it not to age our older viewers out there like they weren't expecting good service too, but you have found you think there's a difference in what the youngest generation of your bank consumers want and expect yeah. out of the bank. Yeah. Look, they want an, an easy to use experience. It's got to be intuitive. So all the mobile uh, uh, efforts that we have uh, are organized around that um, and uh, they get it elsewhere so they need to get it from their bank. Uh, we're trying to have linked products that make sense so uh, student uh, loan refinancing uh, is a really good hook into that millennial segment. Uh, a lot of folks went to college uh, 
have a good job, have a good credit history, they're still paying high rates on their student debt. Uh, the parent office is often is still on the guarantee. There's an opportunity for us to uh, kind of uh, consolidate that debt, uh, uh, kind of refinance it and bring the rate down. So I they think have with more so much attention on pocket. it, people would, people would already already be very aggressive on refinancing. You find that there is still a lot of opportunity yeah, to convince Yeah, there's still opportunity. Uh, you have to have the, the skill set. You have to have the brand. And so we were the, one of the first ones to spot that opportunity and move ahead with it. Uh, SoFi is another uh, kind of fintech that uh, we pretty much share the market with. And then there's trailers uh, behind the two of us. So uh, we've got a nice uh, jump start into that business, and uh, we do it very well. Another thing uh, citizens have started doing uh, since you took over, you are the one financial institution that gives all the loans if someone buys a new iPhone in the Apple store. That's right. And I remember when that came about, I was like, how did, nothing against this, but I would think, I'm sure the biggest financial institutions in the country would be interested yeah. in having that hook right into the Apple store when people are buying the most popular phone brand. How did you manage to get that well, for citizens? Uh, see, we had, again, going back to our student business, uh, we had struck up a relationship with Apple around uh, their desire to finance uh, some of the equipment they sell in student bookstores. Uh, that didn't actually launch uh, and be a big winner for us. Uh, it, was, it was a moderate success. Uh, but they liked our approach to the business. They liked the way we really focus on the customer and trying to deliver a really good customer experience. So when they started thinking about, gee, how could we pull some of the volume of the new, new equipment sales out of the wireless carriers and offer it through our own stores, uh, we'd want to have an installment financing vehicle. Could you help us work through that? We were there for them. So, uh, they had comfort with us. Uh, we've launched, and they're a very demanding uh, customer. They say, you know, I want this experience when somebody comes in to search the phone, buy a phone, finance the phone, walk out of the store, it takes 20 minutes, and my financing partner has like 25 <laughs> seconds to decide whether the person is credit worthy and you're going to do the loan, and they can just kind of initial the documentation and it's done. Uh, so we figured out a good mousetrap and a way to do that, and they're very happy with us, and so it's been a great relationship. And that allows us to pivot and leverage uh, in other ways, and so we're now doing that with a big security alarm company, and there's others in the pipeline, so stay tuned on that. But uh, that's, that's very interesting for us, is uh, you know, to, be, to be joined at the hip with the most iconic uh, company on the planet, that's really positive, but to meet their bar and get really good at customer experience, that helps us in innumerate ways. Yeah, that's going to be, if they're happy, that's going to be one of the best signs for you that your tech folks are doing what they say they're, they're doing, doing to they're get doing. things going fast. Do. So let's let's turn back locally and talk about the new corporate campus in Johnston, which yes. opened not too long ago, as we're sitting here talking early in 2019. Your employees are in there working uh, now. Last time you were here with us, you were very high on uh, what you expected this. It's yep. now open. People are looking here at pictures of it. Is it delivering the way you want? What stands it's fantastic. out to you? It's fantastic. And let me just say again, since we're here in Rhode Island, very, very important market for us, our home uh, state market, big market share, um, over 5,000 employees here. Uh, we wanted to make a statement and uh, move out of some rented facilities, which were uh, less than uh, top rate world class facilities, and put up a world class facility and make that plant that flag here in Rhode Island. And it's gone fantastically well. The whole project, uh, start to finish, was uh, two years. Uh, a fellow named Mike Knipper uh, uh, has run it for us and done a fantastic job. He and his team had great cooperation from uh, Mayor Policina and Johnston, the governor, and uh, her folks, and uh, it was a real win, I think, for Rhode Island and for us. Uh, the engagement scores of the people who are working in that building is uh, sky high. Uh, we actually find that uh, there's more people there than are supposed to be there because people who are assigned to other facilities are coming <laughs> and squatting in some of our conference rooms. So we had to ultimately uh, pave over a grassy field to put in additional parking space because we were running out of parking slots. So that's how popular it is. It's going over very, very well. So as you look out, um, I was thinking about the Johnson campus and obviously the governor said to us, she was very relieved when you made that decision because it was, you know, that's an yep. easy capital investment to undo. It shows you yep. want to stay here for a while. There's so much talk as we start this year among state leaders about skills, about education. Yep. That's a real focus at the State House right now. And as you just mentioned, you have almost 5,000 employees in Rhode Island, and clearly you're going to be hiring people here for a while with the campus you have there. When you look ahead as the person doing the hiring or the one leading the people doing the hiring, what skills do you recommend people acquire? You know, what do you hope that, you know, educators and people doing these training programs, what should they be focusing on, not just for the job today, but the job you think yeah. you'll maybe have to offer in 10 years? I mean, some of the, some of the basic 
basics are still always in, in demand. So, you know, having good communication skills, good math skills, good uh, reading, writing, uh, all those things are really important. But increasingly, the world's moving more towards technology, more towards using data. And so having that, that really quantifiable uh, aptitude for those fields is really important. So we're working now with some of the universities here, working with the governor's office to try to develop programs that uh, can actually uh, bring people through curricula uh, in the junior colleges or in the colleges that then they can uh, have internships with us and then they can move right in and hit the ground running. So increasingly, it's grow your own. Uh, it's, it's a very tight labor market. There's 3.5% uh, employment nationally. I think in financial services, it's 2.5%. And, and so I think that's a big wave in the future is to figure out, you know, how do you, how do you grow your own and, uh, and bring them in already skilled up. Is it hard to find people right now with the labor uh, market as tight? surprising success and I think part of it is the success we've had as a company and the investments we're making to make it a great place to work and build a career I think we're actually not having as much difficulty as I would have expected given the overall economic backdrop I guess if you bring them for the at the beautiful new campus for an yeah, interview they like say that. I think I think I'll come work here <laughs> all right stick with us we're gonna take another break we're gonna talk more with Bruce Van Son about the economic outlook as well as the outlook for some of the partnership the partnership he's working on here in Rhode Island stick with us Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and today we're joined a return appearance by the chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group, Bruce Van Son. And Bruce, I mentioned earlier, I have to ask you about the economic outlook. Uh, you are a banker. You, you Bankers often, I feel like, have a front row seat to what's happening because you see, are people applying for loans as much? What's, what's going on there? And of course, you employ economists, too, who take a look at that. So, you know, you hear people worried about a downturn or a recession or things going to slow down. What's your view right now? Are you concerned about the economic outlook? Do you think that's all overblown? Yeah, we, we have uh, maintained a positive outlook for 2019. Um, I think the momentum that we had in 18 coming off the tax cut and less regulation, pro-energy policies was really good for the economy. We had uh, strong uh, growth in excess of 3%, unemployment coming down, inflation in check. You're almost in a perfect situation. Uh, you know, that should, you know, come down to maybe 2.5% this year, but still be strong and still be stronger than kind of the, the previous administration average, which was probably about 1.8%. So I think it'll still feel good. A couple wild cards out there. We're certainly watching the government shutdown. Uh, what's that going to do if that drags on? That can start to have an impact on economic growth. Uh, this whole uh, trying to reset the trade relations with China, uh, you know, that could work out well, that could and prolong, and that could also have an impact on economic growth. So uh, absent those wild cards, though, I think there's still uh, very good sentiment in the business community. They're doing well, they're cash flowing well, they're making investments, there's incentives in the tax code for them to invest in capital expenditures. Uh, and the individual, we don't see any stress really in terms of uh, you know, borrowers having, as rates have moved up gradually, they've been able to uh, pay the extra, uh, you know, rate as, as rates go up and there hasn't been much stress. So everything looks pretty good. I wonder, as you look at consumer behavior, when we, you know, they always talked about recession babies back in the 30s who went through, the depression babies, excuse me, they went through such a searing experience that it changed their consumer behavior for the rest of their lives. Do you think the Great Recession had that kind of effect on people's I, willingness to take on debt and such, or do you yeah, think it well, I think it's, 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 uh, you know, memories are, are long, but then eventually people go on with their life and they, they get uh, more confident. And I think we're seeing that confidence now. But probably for five, six years after the Great Recession, uh, that was the case. People were shell-shocked and uh, folks realized they had to save. They had, they had levered up too much. And so the savings rate went up, which was good. Uh, but it didn't mean there, was, there, there really wasn't much loan demand on the consumer side for quite some time. I think we've now, over the last you know, two years, started to see revolving credit pick up again. And uh, you know, the auto has been strong relatively. The mortgage market until very recently was pretty strong. And so I think, I think that's the, the, the memories are starting to fade a little bit and there's a little more confidence on the part of investors. But I don't think we'll, we'll get overextended the way we did uh, kind of leading up to the Great Recession. Because that's the next question we'll have. Well, are we just going to do what the yeah. mid-2000s <laughs> experience again and here we yeah, go again? Hopefully but not. And I also <laughs> think the banks are a little, little more prudent now in terms yeah. of lending and so uh, having uh, providing access to credit for subprime borrowers and people who are overextended and some of the excesses particularly that went on in the mortgage market uh, with uh, low doc or no doc lending 
uh, I don't expect to see that uh, come back in any material way. So coming back to Rhode Island, you're um, on the Partnership for Rhode Island group. We've yes. talked to had a number of your fellow board members on here. That's sort of the, the leading CEOs of the state uh, get together periodically and uh, sort of look at how they can be helpful to the state. Looking at it, 2019, um, any, any goals for the group? Anything the group plans to focus on uh, in the new year? You all have pretty busy day jobs, so I know you yeah. assume you have to you know, manage your time and all. Well, I think you know, there's, there's really uh, kind of three uh, big areas that we focused on and one is education uh, and so we've had a program uh, to invest in principals and school leaders and uh, really if you have a great leader of a school district uh, everything else falls into place and so that was really important so we jump-started that and we're continuing to move people in waves through that program and the results have been fantastic uh, we were very supportive of the bond uh, referendum to put money into fixing the physical <laughs> nature of our schools uh, and that actually also has a very positive impact on learning and then also I think this pre-k initiative is also going to be good so if you if you look at how well Massachusetts has done they started investing in education uh, 20 years ago and uh, and it's had a huge impact as the economy moves towards more of a knowledge economy. Those industries uh, having an educated workforce has been really good for their state. So education is kind of number one. Kind of workforce development, skills training. We've had internship programs where we take kids out of high school and we get them jobs in the summer uh, at our companies. And uh, you know, just having a job and just showing up and learning how business operates. And you have to get up and on time and show up for work and be productive. Uh, that can have a real positive impact as well. And then there's other programs that we're putting financial support behind to actually create uh, the skills that we need uh, as employers around the state. And then lastly, the, the, it's probably um, business attraction has been the last thing is to, you know, we, we made an effort to try to get Amazon to think of us as the site for their headquarters and did a little video that we sent to uh, Bezos, which, uh, you know, I think, I think we were in the running for a while, but that was very competitive. But anyway, there were spinoffs out of that effort about all the collateral material we did about why Rhode Island is really an up-and-coming place for people to cite their businesses. Uh, uh, and that's had a, a pretty good success rate. So you can basically they make you call cold call some of your fellow yeah, well, CEOs. Yeah, if, if, <laughs> if the governor has a lead on something, and then she'll ask if we wouldn't mind fielding a call from another CEO, and then we'll talk about the virtues of being in Rhode Island. It's a great place to, to be. So we're coming up on the end of the show. So I have to ask, as I said, you're in. Uh, what you started 2013, so you're in about year six now as CEO. Yeah, just uh, starting in my sixth year. Yeah. So how long do you see yourself staying in this job? I, as long as the board wants me, I serve at the pleasure of the board and as long as I'm having fun and I'm having a lot of fun. We've got a great team. Uh, I think we have a great vision of where we're trying to take the bank. We want, we now, we kind of got through a phase which was the turnaround phase, which we called turning the corner. And I've now coined a new phrase, aiming for excellence. And so we really want citizens to be one of the most uh, admired and respected bank and top performing banks in the land. All right. Well, if you want a good rate, Citizens Access, that's you heard the pitch earlier. Check it out online. Bruce Benzon, thank you so much for joining All us. Right, we'll tight. have you back again as we have before. And thank you for being with us this week on Executive Suite. Remember, if you missed any of this episode or any other episode, you can catch all of those on WPRI.com. And we're back on iTunes. They have fixed the podcast issue. So you can subscribe to us as a podcast. Bruce will be our, our maiden voyage. So uh, sign up there if you want to catch it on your phone. See you back here next week on Executive Suite.